Poetry Center bringing poetry to Patterson since 1980 at Passaic County Community College. Hi everybody. My name is Barry Boss. I'm Laura's son and I want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody and thank you for coming. Um, really appreciate all the support for the foundation and um, for the award winners, finalists and award winners. So thank you for coming uh, to support the foundation and to support them. Um, I thought that we would start, this was actually Michelle Lerner's idea, that we'd start with a, a very short video, because some of you, I think, didn't have the opportunity to meet my mother. Um, if you had met her or read her poetry, I think you'd probably remember it. Um, but we thought it would be helpful to give you a sense of who she was to do a little four minute video to start. What I was just gonna say um, before I knew we had a video about my mother was that she was incredibly, um, in her poetry, incredibly honest, uh, unembarrassed, um, and unapologetic. Um, and she, expressed her emotions and said things that she felt that she would say at that moment, um, but um, they were incredibly embarrassing to me, but <laughs> not the slightest bit embarrassing to her. Um, and today actually, um, coincidentally, is uh, my 23rd uh, wedding anniversary. Um, and I'd like to say that there's some really like profound reason why we scheduled the award ceremony on that day, but the truth of the matter is I just forgot. Um, but there is actually a connection with Kathy um, because the first time she met my mother was at the January 1st poetry reading at CBGB's. And I don't know if any of you were ever there for that, but it was quite an interesting um, <laughs> phenomena. And, um, my mother got up to read, and I remember she never met Kathy before, and Kathy and I had always had this debate about whose family was more eccentric. That wasn't the word we used, but I'll, I'll use that here. Um, and my mother got up, and she read the poem, Of Course I Was a Virgin, um, which, in, in which she uses the word penis at least 25 times. <laughs> Um, and it was, Kathy says more times than she's ever heard her mother in her life mention it. Um, and she got done reading the poetry. There was rave, you know, response, people screaming, what's the name of your book? Um, and Kathy turned to me at the end of that and said, you win with regard to the family. <laughs> um, so I want to take this opportunity. Oh, do we have the videos going? So, yeah, sure. Are based on some strong feeling that one has, uh, and that's a catalyst for writing. And those feelings can be love or loss. As Emily Dickinson said, most poems, and I'm paraphrasing, are about love or loss. And love it could be love of one's love of one's. A romantic love, or love of one's freedom, or love of a family member, or it could be in loss, of course, death, but it could be loss again of one's freedom, of one's beliefs, of one's youth. So you can take it all the way to um, the end of the street, so to speak. I think, like Yeats, he he wrote romantic poems when he was young, and he wrote political poems. And then at the end, he was writing about mortality. And I think I'm writing a lot about what it is like to be older in our community. This is a title poem for my uh, latest book, The Best Lover, that was published by uh, New York Quarterly. And it's called The Best Lover. I tell every man I'm with that he is the best lover I've ever had. He always believes me. I feel if he asks me, then that's the only answer he wants to hear. And sometimes, and somehow, at that moment after lovemaking, 
I almost believe it myself. Maybe it's not so different from when someone asks you, which of your books do you think is your best? And you almost always answer, it's my most recent. <laughs> well, I think that as most poets, I'm very alert to whatever is going on around me. Okay, well, you see what I mean. <laughs> um, so I do want to take this opportunity to um, recognize Maria, who was my mother's, one of my mother's closest friends, certainly her strongest poetry friend. Um, and they did so many things together. And my mother always said that, um, you know, we were always giving positive results to, to poets and giving them positive feedback, but Maria always knew the truth. Um, they were really close and Maria supported my mother throughout her life all the way to the end. And I'm so grateful that she agreed to um, be on the foundation board. Um, and she's very much sort of the, the leading light for us in terms of what my mother would have wanted. Um, and I also want to thank the other board members, all of whom have agreed just to volunteer on the board and help run this um, and keep lips going and keep the award going. And um, we've got Jim Gwynn, um, who's the publisher of Lips, Michelle Lerner, who, um, if you write in to the Laura Boss Foundation, she's the one reviewing the emails and basically running the show. Jim Haba, who comes with tremendous poetry history and who my mother always deeply respected. Ken Rockowitz, who we couldn't do this without him because he runs all the technology and the social media and does a great job of getting the word out. And obviously we've been successful in getting a lot of people here today. I think thanks in no small part to him. Um, I also want to thank Jose Antonio Rodriguez for doing the um, judging of the contest. Um, I want to congratulate Miriam for winning and, oh, here she is. Here she is. <laughs> and all the finalists. Um, I know I really enjoyed reading all of the poems and um, I'm so happy that we get to recognize you um, and also at the same time honor my mother. Um, Finally, I want to thank um, Raymond Hammond from New York Quarterly, who so graciously agreed to publish the winning book and continues to do that. It's tremendously um, you know, generous of him um, to do that, and we really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to all of you who support the foundation. Um, we live on the contributions, and that's what keeps us going. So thank you very much, and thanks for being here today. And I'll turn it over to Maria. Thanks so much, Barry. And I also want to say about where I hear her voice, and it really makes me want to cry. Uh, I can't believe she's gone. But she isn't. She's really still here in spirit. And I know she would have loved the poems that were chosen uh, for the award because that was her kind of poetry. And she was never afraid to tell the truth. And she told it straight, not slim. And she wasn't afraid to tell it straight. I still remember one time when we went to do a reading and her skirt fell off. <laughs> and most of us would have crawled under the sage and died right there. But not Laura. She picked the button stamped on her skirt. So it fell down, and underneath, she was wearing very sexy underclothes. <laughs> so she picked the skirt up off the floor, and she just held it together, and went on the stage and did a reading. And that was Laura. She, she was the, one of the most generous people to other poets, and to give advice, and to give help to other poets. Um, she would have loved the idea of this award and the fact that her name lives on. Uh, for me, her name will always live on, but I hope this award will help her, lay, her legacy to be carried on. And she loved narrative poetry. Um, she was not really a fan of obscure uh, poetry, and she was a big fan of poetry that told the truth. Anyway, today we have Miriam Levine, who won uh, first prize for her book, Forget About Sleep. 
and there are copies outside for sale, and I'm sure she'd be happy to sign them after. I'm just going to read, you have her bio. One thing we didn't know, uh, Jose's in Texas. He's a professor at a university in Texas. And he didn't say anything, and we didn't know until Ken discovered by going on the web, we didn't know that Miriam had lived for a while in Patterson and then in Passaic. And we just didn't know that. In fact, she has a, no a novel set in Patterson, I believe. Anyway, I'm not gonna bother to read the bios because I think you have bios in your program. And uh, I think that I'll just read the first two lines so that people hearing this on, on YouTube will be able to um, just get the basic idea. Uh, forget about sleep as her sixth collection. Uh, Mark Doty chose her collection, The Dark Old Opens, for the Autumn House Poetry Prize. And she, her work has appeared in lots of very prestigious magazines. Uh, she's received she grants from the NEA and the Massachusetts Arts Foundation, and she lives in New Hampshire and Florida. Uh, and she's also published a novel in Patterson. Um, her grandfather came to Patterson from Poland, and her aunt worked in the silk mills as a warper and weaver. And the quote from Jose, who was my graduate student at Binghamton University uh, 15 years ago, and is now a professor at this university in um, Texas. And he also, I want to say yesterday, had another poem uh, in The New Yorker. Some things I am envy very much, I have to say. <laughs> anyway, I had another poem in The New Yorker. And he says, says of Miriam's book, I found a collection suffused with varied emotions and questions that come from a lifetime of memories about childhood friends, adolescent romance, desire, pain, aging parents, parents of friends, about community and its relationship to the beautiful, if indifferent, natural world that nonetheless remains ever open to meaning. Ultimately, the poems here trace the exquisite struggle to make meaning expansive and pro profound. Forget about sleep is a triumph. Let's welcome Miriam Mead. Hi, everyone. Thanks to the board. Thanks to my publisher, Raymond Hammond, at New York Quarterly Books. Thanks to Barry Boss. And thanks to all of you who have come out to Patterson, where I was born, and lived for a brief period before coming to Passaic. I want to say that the book is dedicated to my friend, the author, Julia Marcus. She and I met in a dormitory at Boston University years ago. And we've been talking and exchanging ideas ever since. I want to quote from a poet that I admire, Seamus Haney. When he was introduced and told that his work was wonderful and that praise was heaped on him, you know what he said? He said, let's not make this an occasion for sin. And I always love that. But maybe we can, we can sin a little bit. We can sin just a little bit and have some fun with that. I'll quote another poet before I get started. And that poet, Wallace Stevens, said that description is revelation. Description is revelation. And I think that that would connect with Laura Boss. I never knew her. And I'm just getting to know her a little bit. Description is revelation. I'll read the first poem from Forget About Sleep. 
deeper, darker. Everything bright will darken. This day, that star, this river, little frill of blackberry flowers giving way to insistent fruit. The boy's voice, deeper, darker. Our sky, the swelling cloud, leaf and the shadow of the leaf, bird and the bird's cry. It's late, we're not done with love. Speaking of love, here's a kind of love poem. It's set in New Hampshire on Union Street. And I think Union is a kind of, connects to love in some way. It's called Union Street. The calm fall night when blazing leaves were invisible and the curtain of the living room window blurred the gold dome of the Capitol building, recognizable, though beautifully veiled. And three windows of the house on Center Street also came through, but these in pale blue. And I thought, everything is in its place, hushed and muted, even the street, there was enough light in the room to see the rug's edge and the arm of your chair. I did not have to do anything but rest. The door to your bedroom was open and your nightlight showed a familiar path I might have taken to watch you dreaming. Okay, you know, lately men are getting a very bad rap for certain things, but many men are very beautiful. And this poem is called The Charioteer in Sicily, and it's the poet, yours truly, otherwise known as Mimi Levine, looking at a statue the statue, an ancient statue of the charioteer. When I saw the photo of the statue for the first time, I was shocked that anyone could chisel the liquid shape of a man from such faceless stone and make stone cloth drop from chest to ankles in waterfall folds nearly transparent, clinging as if wet with sweat. The right leg thrusts forward, so weight rests on the left leg, raising the hip contraposto. The knees like a giant peony in bud, the flux buttocks horse-like and the swelling sex too much for the cloth. If I were there, I would see even more closely the snail curls at the brow, the seamless bandeau around the chest. I would follow the vein to its source and wonder at the exhausted impassive face as I gazed into another age. Okay, now for a change of pace, and this has to do with a favorite of mine. Let me see if I can get this open. His name, his name is Richard Wayne Penniman, also known as Little Richard. 
singer, musician, songwriter, and brave soul. It's called high C. He could hit those high notes. Little Richard, high C. This spring, when your inner life is Little Richard, you surrender to his octave jumping high notes as he shakes out the fringes of his glittering coat. His boots glitter too. How narrow those feet and those wigs. How full. Is that your hair, he's asked? It's mine. I bought it. <laughs> decade after decade, you see him age, but are convinced he beats back time. And always his beauty endures. Bare-chested, under his cape, he strolled through Heathrow. Man, drop his cup of coffee when he see me. And I give him the peace sign. Now he's screaming and streaming through earbuds into your brain. And you know, I'll always be your slave until I'm buried, buried in my grave. Your step is easy as you walk south on Meridian Avenue to your allotment in the Victory Garden and the blooming zinnia called Zowie, streaked crimson and gold. You keep time with his time and the blooms also seem to sway with the beat. At night you see him preach about Jesus and watch his funeral. He believed he would live forever with Jesus. You confess you read the auction catalog of his things. You don't want his flaming clothes, but you covet his passport. The photo of him with the impossibly high pompadour and the ink line mustache, page after page stamped with seals of countries he never left. Okay, forget about sleep. How do you title a book? It's, it's a problem. What do, you, what do you use for your title? Sometimes you pick a title of a poem in the book. You think, you choose this one, you choose that one. And finally, I came up with Forget About Sleep. And sleepless nights, anybody ever have them? <laughs> right, forget about sleep. The little deaths between breaths Mim, be afraid. I'm talking to myself. We do that. The little deaths between breaths. Mim, be afraid. Tremble. Here's yesterday. Your brother, broken, blue-eyed, always your brother, and your mother who sang in the dark, will the next breath come? Where is the pink lip doll of childhood Soft blanket, the street below, the one tree and cinder strewn curb strip, those sparrows, the smell of rain, tiny windows of the black screens where blue raindrops swell, your crib, the fever, and the cool hand. Where is your first friend? Who in your dreams danced through walls, her deep-hemmed cotton dress, the pocket too small for her hand. Where is her dog, those eyes cunning with love? Be afraid of the falling ash staining the maple, the room of the future with nothing in it. Go ahead, worry them, 
Do you, do you hear me? Your hands remember their claws, no matter how much you cut the nails and slick on polish. Or do they? Mim, forget about yourself. Mim, forget about yourself. The radiators are too hot to touch. Wind thrums down the vent. There's thunder, not enough air for the candle. Forget about sleep, Mim. Why would you ever want to leave the earth? Okay, here's a short one. Not sleepless nights now. This poem begins with a question. What will I need? When I tilt back in the zero gravity chair, my pen is charged with green ink. My book open like a cat on its back. I search for words. I knew by heart, I want to mark them. The thing is to have made someone care, writes Henry James. The thing is to make someone care. But then print wiggles, swims, and blurs. Where are my glasses? Seeming miles away in the room down the hall. What will I need when I'm dying? Grace to speak a tender word. Strength to touch my darling. Softness to let go of everything. I live part of the year in a very, very hectic place, uh, South Beach, and it's getting more and more hectic. But there's some wonderful uh, experiences in South Beach. And here's one. This poem is called Already Here. Do you know how sometimes we're longing for things? I want this, I want that. And this poem testifies that what I think I need is here already. The hell with Amazon, I'm not going to order. <laughs> OK, already here. What I might have wished for is already here. The long, little, the long, loose line of pelicans flying north that seems to break but comes together. The man on the sidewalk near 6th Street, always the unlit cigar in his hand, guarding a promise. The trans swishing through Flamingo Park, shaking out her curls, calling, darling, 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 I'm here. Beautiful boys racing the spongy track, backs shining with sweat, wave after wave filming the sand with amethyst. Colors fading, the waves always and always returning. The flash of green parrots flocking, the egret balancing on the top of the hedge, color of cedar, the negligent filmy curtain dragging on the sill, casino ships on the horizon with no destination, the old woman who asks for directions to Alton Road and my correct answer, and the young man who suddenly appears and says, I'm going your way. <laughs> yes. Now November, the last poem I will read. Again, there's nothing like uh, November in New England. November. These days, 
when wind wears itself out and sun warms the sidewalk, bare throat days, when white floss bulges from milkweed pods but does not blow away, and leaves float like scattered thoughts, when the hinge between fall and winter does not move. And those nights, those nights too, when long past midnight, windows are flooded with light, and it seems everyone on this street is awake, timed and tuned to something we cannot see, something I imagine faith to be. Thank you. So Emily Highland comes to us today from the land of enchantment, also known as New Mexico. She earned her MFA in poetry and her MA in English education from Brooklyn College. Her collection, Divorced Business Partners, was a finalist for both the Hollis Summer Poetry Prize and the Unleashed Press Books Award and will be published this October. Emily is the only poet I know of who is also a restaurateur. She is co-founder of the restaurant groups Pizza Loves Emily in Brooklyn and West Village, and Emily Squared Pizza, which is all over the place. I've actually eaten at the Washington, D.C. location. Her cookbook, Emily the Cookbook, was published by Ballantine Books in 2018. And if that's not enough, she teaches and is a partner at Yoga Source in Santa Fe. Here's Emily Highland. Too tall. Okay. And congratulations, Thank Mary. You. Same to you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, so I'll read just right from the middle of the drama. Um, Divorced business partners takes place at a small mom and uh, mom and pop restaurant, uh, and it's owned by a husband and wife who are in the thick of things. Um, these will kind of come in sequence, so you don't need to applaud in between each one. Um, all right, well, this first one is called Hatch. Brad and I just had another argument mid-service. It was horrible, the yelling in front of staff and guests again. I've come out for air. Joey's taking a break from the line, so I lean against bricks while Joey chain smokes and ruminates. He tells me you're a beam of light. He paces in orbit in a half-moon pattern around me, and each footstep he takes clings the hatch near the latch. I can't see stars beyond the fuzzy city mug of gray, but we're aglow in the halo of street lamp and car light tuned into this landscape's hum. I tell him there are these things I want to say. I say, there's a lot unspoken between us. I lean, he continues to patrol this true moment, continues to smoke, to look at me, and then to look away. We look out beyond the weedy chain link, past cars beeping down Atlantic, then he notices I bite my lip. He tells me, you bite your lip when you hesitate. I know he's right. I also spin my ring with my right thumb and pointer in hot circles like a race car burning the pavement around a track. Near the end, he stays out with her until sunrise, sitting on the grassy knoll of the William Vale Hotel, watching Jetsam catch moonlight on the river. We made out, he tells me later. Then I threw up and took a car home. I've been staying out until the bars close with Joey on Saturdays anyway, ripping coasters into sawdust while drinking IPA. I've been asking him to kiss me, tugging on his coat or trying to wriggle my hand into his in an Uber over the bridge back to Brooklyn. He always keeps the boundary. I don't even realize how much I want to break my marriage. A week after Brad leaves, we have to shoot a PR piece. 
the director has us stand together, keep saying closer, then once we're as close as the fiction insists, he cues me to say, I love pizza, and then Brad to say, and I love you, then for us to look at each other and give the camera a wedding altar kiss. The piece doesn't air. <laughs> and this is called Assault with a Canvas Bag, or I don't even know how to read it, Assault with a Weapon Struck Through Canvas Bag. So Assault with a Canvas Bag. Is it true? I ask him on the street outside the restaurant. He's moving in with her. He looks off, out of focus, a dragonfly zips by. I ask again, and when I ask, how long has it been? He says with a dead arrow, it's none of your business. And there's this moment of space in between my breath in and my breath out where I still in the dark ice of this impossible storyline as if curled into the nook of him watching a plot unfold like in Birdman, then pulling apart to look at each other, astonish and ask what just happened? I throw a seltzer can at his chest, then shove him from the sink in my breast. I don't see red as they say, move first as witness to myself, undone in fury, then lose any track of action. I know I swung my bag and screamed. I know I kept trying and trying to wake him back up. Where has he gone, the man who took my hand across the streets? The men from the barber shop pour out to break up the scene. My service team peeks out from the restaurant window, lighting candles. And as it goes, two officers are strolling by. So when I sort of come out of my initial gaze, I stand handcuffed, my stuff strewn across the street. I hear the well and wallop of my sounds somewhere between howls and morning sobs. I hear the barber urge, be calm, be calm, but I can't steady. Seeing past to Brad, who does look calm, on his phone, he stands away, collar still correctly creased, the white of his shirt unsullied, untouched, hair neat. He looks away, chest steered down the street towards where she lives, and he heads out as I'm taken in. And then, Laura Boss, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> going to the bathroom in central booking. When the officer walks me into the cell, I see the metal toilet in the open in the left corner by the bars. It's not even in the back. There are 12, bar there are 12 bars. I try to remember it all. I count the bars, 12 bars, 18 other women, two benches, both taken, vent amassed with dust, a, limp a lint trap thick. I sit on the floor, come to be again, touch my wrists bruised from cuffs. Remember my body, brush of air on my skin, the pressure of urine above and behind my pubic bone. I look again at the metal toilet and my bladder remembers it's now been hours and I decide to hold it because how long can this possibly take? Someone must have told my sister some lawyer must be on the way. I know there is a lawyer on the way. The lawyer must be on the way. The only place to really sit is near the toilet. The unit is particularly full of tension on this muggy August afternoon. The ally calls to my guts as a magnet for release. I admit how badly I need to go. I tell myself we're just a bunch of women sitting on the floor. Someone in here has pulled down her pants before, I'm almost sure. I'm going to have to do this soon, so I might as well as do it now. So I sort of ask to no one at all, what do we do when we need to go? A cellmate tells me, yell to the CO for toilet tissue. She'll bring you some from the roll. I thank my friend and press my body to the bars. It feels unnatural to shout like I would to mom from the TV room when she'd call for dinner and we'd call back. The group is amused by my soft caw out so someone hollers, I'm grateful her voice booms and bellows for me down the hall. The CO gives me a few sheets. Thank God I only have to pee. I study the toilet, my complete foe, see the gunk and crud and film around the seat. I plan to squat. I take a breath and look around, unbutton and unzip my jeans, then slowly pull the denim down. And as I start to feel the stream, a fart comes out. 
I can't control its loud and long, a foghorn blow that's thick with shame, and on the beat, a pure roars out, hot damn, this bitch has got some gas. <laughs> Another laughs loud and slaps her leg. She could shoot a car across the state. <laughs> the whole cell is rolling on the ground. I wipe so quick, I feel the wet all down my thigh. I sort of roll my eyes, then smile to realize the glue in this long, short spell. Any chance to break the buzz of dwell and hot on we, an act of craft. I have more left, so toot again. And we all crack up so hard it hurts against the concrete floor, where we'll all together later lay our heads and wait our turns until we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michelle Larner will introduce Nancy Lubars. I am not too tall. Yeah, everything usually needs to go way to the floor for me. Um, Nancy Labarsky is the author of two books, Tattoos from Finishing Line Press and The Only Proof from Kelsey Press, which is for sale outside. Um, her latest book, Truth to the Rumors, also from Kelsey Press, will be published this floor, fall. Nancy is an, has been an educator for over 35 years and a retired school superintendent. She's been published in various journals, including Exit 13, Lips, which is Laura Boss's um, magazine, to Ferret, Poetica, Stillwater Review, and Patterson Literary Review. She received multiple honorable mentions from the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Award and also from the Anna Davidson Rosenberg Poetry Contest. Please welcome Nancy Labarsky. I'm so happy to be here um, among my fellow honorees, and congratulations to you and to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, my first poem is entitled Vacation Bible School. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. This had to be what Miss Marie told my mother after she knocked on our door to solicit young lambs for the next week's session. With her blonde bob and belted dress, she could have been June Cleaver borrowing a cup of sugar. In early summer, as the temperature rose, my mother left her recliner, peeled away layers of woolens, slipped on her best dress, first sign of her manic swing, so she was ready to respond to the knock. My older sister, out with friends, had long ago withdrawn from my mother's orbit, which left me as the offering. I heard my mother chat with Miss Marie. She was both attentive and erratic, fueled by a cocktail of barometric pressure and neural misfirings. My father, at work, did not know what was being sacrificed here. Our freezer was filled with kosher meat. We still used separate dishes and lit Friday night candles. Yet she signed me up for a week of Jesus in Miss Marie's living room. <laughs> Mom, we're Jewish, we're Jewish, I whispered, but she wanted me there. Miss Marie smirked, young lady, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> this poem is called I'm Still Waiting. I'm still waiting for the Dakota ring the x-ray specs and the hypno coins from the back pages of my Archie comics. I rip out the thumb-sized sketches that promise to transport me beyond my childhood and reveal the hidden secrets of my parents. It's all junk, they scold, plastic trinkets, a scam. I ignore their warnings. The color-splashed ads flaunt satisfied customers. Jughead-like sad sacks grow Charles Atlas biceps Petless children raise bowls of sea monkeys. The Dakota ring will unlock the Yiddish jibber-jabber flying around our apartment. The x-ray specs will permeate their bedroom door, expose my mother's fears, my father's anguish. If all else fails, the hypnocoin will guide them into a deep trance, compel them to stop yelling. I send off the envelope, 
allowance coins taped inside. I wait, but nothing comes. When I'm older, I realize there really were no secrets. It was always about money or illness. Nothing rings or glasses could ever fix. Thank you. So this, this next poem is about my son. It's called The Path. I argued with the McDonald's counter girl until the line swelled behind me. She slid the Happy Meal prize back toward my teary son, explained that the car was all she could give him. The doll, she insisted, is for a girl. Maybe with just these few words, you can tell where this is headed, but we couldn't. Parents have enough to think about. We arrange activities, shepherd homework, scrutinize what they eat. We clear obstacles from the path we hope they take. On the sidelines, we make predictions. His smile, oh, he'll be a charmer. The way she argues, definitely an attorney. But their own rutted journey begins way before their feet touch ground. Of course, there were times we stumbled. The debate over Dr. Barbie, would you rather a toy gun? Websites left open. He's just curious. Mysterious phone calls and meetings. Where are you going? Our older son's reports of taunts because he's in plays. A hickey on his neck. Maybe we were mistaken. And finally, New Year's Eve, we came home to a note on our pillow. He's been traveling 17 years in this direction. Just a small part of who I am, he advised us. He explains his other options just in case. In the meantime, he would stay at a friend's, wait for our call to come back home. This poem is entitled, The Landing. The night Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, I was drafting my first and only steamy sex novel. It was the summer after sixth grade, I was 12. My mission, I thought, was to fill the void between beach blanket movies and Valley of the Dolls, read with my parents' permission. Never mind that no boy had ever touched me or even asked me out. My only kiss came from the spin of a bottle. While the world was riveted to TV screens, my characters were in a car on a hilltop about to undress. The moon looked equally inviting. The US was ready to conquer the space race as I attempted to finish the next chapter. Hearts dotted the eyes of scribbled loose leaf pages as they fell to the floor. Inside the space capsule, Armstrong was anxious. Just before the landing, one panel flashed an error code. There was little fuel left. Meanwhile, my protagonist struggled with his girlfriend's buttons. It appeared that both men might overshoot the projected landing zones. <laughs> But subtle and adroit last minute maneuvers led to triumph. The world cheered. My friends read my story and were also pleased. <laughs> this poem is entitled Shane Walsh Field. And I'm a, a, you know, I, I was an English teacher for many years and Shane was my student. And two of the stanzas are, are actually excerpts from one of his poems. Shane Walsh Field. My walking path curves around the baseball field. The newly cut lawn erases past season's footprints, but some players linger. Shane's name rises up. White letters arch over the red backstop, a name I hadn't thought of since I retired. He transferred midterm from his failed year at Our Lady of Perpetual Intolerance, a baseball player, a baseball player who never spoke. He reserved his words for the page. He took to the Canterbury Tales assignment. Chaucer might have agreed that Shane's prologue was a worthy imitation. We're a team full of various social chunks, nerds, hoods, and braggers, some of us drunks. We've been brought together by a common theme. Baseball's our sport, being champs is our dream. His journey was just beginning, but I was no longer his teacher. Shane forgot that stories could meander, change course. In his post high school version, he never anticipated the plot twist. I saw the end of Shane's story before he did, in print tossed on my lawn. He was headed for college stardom. What were his thoughts that dark night alone as he swerved into the path of that tree? 
I am Shane Walsh, a dominant force. I ace pitchers like nerds ace a physics course. I'm above the rest, ahead of the game. I'll make all the fans remember my name. This next poem is called My Aunt Showed Up Last Week on My Zoom Call. You showed up last week on my Zoom call. I didn't notice at first. I was amazed you even had a computer. We were on gallery view, a sheet of postage stamps. There were enough of us on screen, so I don't think the others noticed you. But then we made eye contact. You smiled when I smiled. We were both muted. I tried to say hi in the chat, but you didn't respond. You looked younger than when I had last seen you in your luxury Florida condo that peeked out from the palm tree jungle. The resemblance to my father was more obvious. Your almond eyes clear, your once gray hair now dyed brown and much shorter, your teeth straighter, whiter. It was such a relief to see you. You were my mother long after my mother was gone. I clicked on the speaker button. One strange face filled the screen. The rest of us disappeared. I tried to stay focused on the lecture, but it was hard not to wonder. Things hadn't ended well with my cousins. Unfinished goodbyes swiped away by selfish sons who waited for you to die for your money. In a desperate moment at your request, one son told you how to end it. Save your pills, swallow them all at once. But your aide overheard and saved you from yourself. I wanted them to move you to New Jersey, but they said it cost too much. They left you to die alone in a nursing home. I didn't question how you got here. I was so happy to see you. The lecture was ending. We were back on gallery. I noticed you were wearing my shirt, my earrings, and then you were gone. And finally, this poem will be the last poem in my upcoming collection. It's called Train Ride. I board the train to New York City this morning. I hear the scrape of metal, a quiet chug, garbled announcements, the car jerks as the train departs. Only then I figure out my seat faces backwards. I'm disoriented, a bit queasy. I don't like this view. Through filmy windows, trees and factories rush by, escape my awareness. I can't see the video billboards that play short vignettes of what I need to buy or signs that reveal what's coming. All I see are blank backs. But then I realize I can linger, gaze a bit longer. I imagine my stories on the back of these signs. What's already happened is clearer. I can't see what's ahead. It's a gift that we don't know what awaits us. Stephen S. Mills. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Gwynn. Um, it's, it's a big pleasure to be um, introducing our next poet. But um, first off, I want to make a, uh, a shameless plug for Lips Magazine. I've worked with um, Laura for many years and um, started with her on lips in 19, you know, back in the 19s, yeah, 1996, you know, seven, or something like that. And um, with the continuation of uh, lips through the board, uh, we're able to bring you a lot of different poets from a lot of different backgrounds. And uh, without the board, I don't know if uh, the print version of uh, Lips Magazine would be continuing. Um, but we are robust, we are strong. Our next uh, reading will be June 15th at the Clifton, New Jersey, Main Library. So come on out for that event. It's a Saturday, uh, 2 p.m., and uh, we'll have a good time. I, I see some of you are in, the, uh, are in the edition, so come on out. We're going to have a whole bunch of other people there, too. So um, that, uh, that should, be, should be nice. Um, it's my honor, as I said, to introduce Steve, excuse me, Stephen S. Mills. Uh, he's published several books through Sibling Rivalry Press. And uh, his work has also appeared in a number of uh, 
uh, magazines and uh, journals, uh, American Poetry Review, Columbia Poetry Review, Antioch Review, New York Quarterly, and others. Uh, two of his books were placed on um, the Over the Rainbow list, which is compiled every year by the American Library Association, uh, which does very important work. Um, he's also a, a playwright, author of a couple plays, Waiting for Manilow, and Is That All There Is? Lives in New York City and um, has made it out here today to New Jersey. Please welcome Stephen S. Mills. Thank you. Uh, no, this is a great event. I really appreciate uh, being invited to read as, as a finalist here. And I really appreciated uh, Barry's introduction uh, about, about Laura Boss and learning more about that, which makes more sense of why my book was, was selected <laughs> here. So uh, this, I'm reading pieces from that manuscript. Uh, the book is called uh, We Will Always Be Perverts, and it explores <laughs> um, aspects of of queer life, all of the poems begin uh, with the same two words. They all begin with in life. Uh, all the titles begin with that. Um, so the, the first poem I'm going to read is called In Life, They Are Calling Us Groomers Again. Remember that night in college when we shaved each other's legs, or leg in my case, so much hair, your arm growing tired, my body unable to stand still any longer, so we gave up and fucked because that's what you do when you're young and in love, and some of the only queers on your small Midwestern campus where other boys write fag on your dorm room door. So I went around with one hairy leg, one smooth, or as smooth as your razor skills allowed, though it didn't matter. It was winter in Indiana, pants and socks and snow. I never shaved again. I like legs hairy, ass too. Like the time I got second place in a hairiest ass contest at a leather bar our first year in New York. Second in a room full of bears is an accomplishment. <laughs> but the real prize was the blurry photo you took drunk from across the bar. Though my hair isn't dark, which makes it hard to see in photographs, but still I know it's there, captured. And I'm reminded of those young men's faces I saw at the Museum of Modern Art, snapshots under glass by an unknown photographer who took portraits at fairs and carnivals throughout the Midwest in the 1950s, and how I zeroed in on those young men, a rarity, arms around each other, chiseled handsome faces, an immediate recognition across time and space. How one of them might have brushed a hair from the other's face right before the camera snapped shut, a simple act, like when you pluck the stray hairs from my shoulders without my request, and I let out exaggerated shouts of pain and playfully tell you to stop, and you say, grooming is an act of love. <laughs> All right, um, in, in life, we dance at a gay bar named after a dead first lady. And they play Jolene by Dolly, and we sing at the top of our lungs as the boys all move in and out of doors, to and from the dance floor, to and from the water that is so close by, here on the edge of the island. And you say, can you imagine writing a song about a bank teller you were jealous of and having it survive this long? And I laugh, asking if you've forgotten I'm a writer, and no matter what any writer tells you, that is always our goal, survival and popping up in odd places, like a bar named after Jackie O in Greece, where her face is blown up on the side of the stairwell, young and fresh Jackie, a little blurry, all before fame and tragedy, which makes me think of other dead first ladies and how people rewrite the stories of dead white women, always giving them extra room, like when Hillary Clinton praised Nancy Reagan for her work fighting AIDS and all the gays gasped, how easily the pieces are rearranged don't speak ill of the dead, they say. Fuck that, I say. But Jackie was different, brave and beautiful, with a keen eye for fashion, which makes her an easy gay icon. Like her insistence on continuing to wear that bloody pink Chanel suit that changed America, changed our access to information. But that picture isn't here in this bar, where we dance miles from home, trying to forget the tragedies of America, of our moment, of our soon-to-be history. 
And I think of the mother I recently saw in Washington, D.C., taking her little boy around the First Lady's exhibit, which is mostly dishes and dresses, and how she stopped in front of Mamie Eisenhower's dress, turned to her son and said, the dress is prettier than the woman. She wasn't very attractive, was she? And I remember how he looked up at Mamie's photograph and asked, but was she nice? And I wanted to hug this boy right in front of the dishes and the dresses and his awful mother, but all I did was stand there and listen as she answered, I don't know, I didn't know her. And then this poem is, uh, is called In Life, the woman sitting next to me on the plane asks, what happens if a big wave hits New York City? <laughs> she has spent the trip reading her Bible, open-faced on the tray table, which has now been stored in its upright position for our descent into New York City, which we can see from above in all its glistening winter glory. She doesn't begin with the wave, it's other simpler questions, which I try to answer quickly going back to my own book, which is a Bible of sorts, a Bible of some queer man's boyfriends, his hookups, his affairs. I wonder if she's seen all the fucks and holes on the pages as I flipped them. I'm guessing no, since she's now engaging me in mindless conversation. Is Central Park really that great? Yes, I say it is. She's just passing through, heading farther south, worries she'll miss her connection and get stuck in this city where she's never been, just over it, through it, never fully in it. I say she should come sometime, though I don't mean it. Then I attempt my, to open my book again, but that's when she spots the Statue of Liberty, as if she's surprised to find it there in the water. It's so small, she says, and I wonder if she understands perspective, our relationship to land. But I just nod, and that's when the wave comes into mind, and the question, so strange, what happens if a big wave hits New York City? She almost whispers it against the window, her lips away from me, so I pretend not to hear. As we get closer and closer to the earth, the landing gear opening, and then that moment of contact, that return. All right, and the, the last piece I'm gonna, gonna read here is, uh, is called In Life My Husband Buys Me a Tourniquet. <laughs> Shows me how to pull the strap, how to twist the metal bar, which he says I'll need to do harder and tighter than I think it needs to go. It's going to hurt. If I'm doing it on myself, I might want to lean against a wall to give myself some leverage, something to push against. Here, try it and I do, and then he tightens it a little more to demonstrate his point. My skin purples, always sensitive. You want it as high up the limb as possible, he says, and then you must twist until the bleeding stops. Quickly, you've only got seconds. This is his normal. His is a life of saving lives, of blood and missing limbs, and by default, it is mine. We've moved past denial into this place of talking about the unthinkable, of being prepared like a Boy Scout, of calmly practicing technique, practicing how to save our lives, or maybe how to save the other from the dread of what not saving might mean. Though saving in this case could still mean a missing piece. There's a woman who created an Instagram account for her amputated foot. The foot gets around, beaches, sporting events, airplanes, <laughs> A skeletal reminder of what was once attached. Humans find so many ways to adapt, like us here in the living room with this tourniquet, our answer to a changing world, something to do when the next tragedy strikes, something to hold in our hands, something to place in our bags, which we will carry through and around this city on our way back to each other. Thank you. Introduce Sharon Kennedy, Kennedy Noel. Noel, sorry. Um, I was uh, pleased that I was 
uh, able to introduce Sharon Kennedy Knoll. I regard her as a heroic survivor of uh, academic life, and in particular, uh, graduate school. She uh, is one of the few people I know who managed to survive getting a PhD at the University of Iowa and still is able to write a poem. And then she got uh, an MFA at the uh, Writers' Workshop of the University of Iowa. And then she got an MA at Johns Hopkins University. And then she got an MA at NYU. <clears throat> and so it's amazing that she's still <laughs> walking and talking, let alone <laughs> writing poems. And she's now the uh, Poet Laureate of Sullivan County in New York, and she's just received a um, Poet Laureate Fellowship from the uh, um, American Academy of Poets. And um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to welcome her here today. Well, I don't know quite what to say <laughs> to that introduction. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, really an honor uh, to learn more about Laura and to have this event in her memory. I think it's, it's great. So I'm going to read you some poems from my manuscript, Not Waving, the lines from Stevie Smith's I'm Not Waving, I'm Drowning. Um, most of the poems in the book concern uh, my oldest son. Better to say nothing. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe a little lower, maybe a little lower. <laughs> that, that, that's good, maybe a little higher. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ken. Mm -hmm. Ten-year-old you sealed your mouth shut with duct tape. Battleship Gray, strips enough to patch a Corsair. You other eyes engaged with books and b-ball, miming Emmett Kelly's sad smile and making layup after layup. The baby giggled. Grandma and I shrugged through our household drudgery. I avoiding your drawn eyes. Lower lids yanked down into the bloodshot spaces. Then the doorbell. New neighbor with a package. Wrongly delivered, you getting there first, taking the mail, nodding, nothing to it. But Grandma rushed the storm door, gushing, my grandson's a little silly, still thinks it's Halloween, anticipating a call from Child Protection Services. She and I'd howl about it long after, when it seemed no big deal, though it would take a day to scrub off your heavy beard of adhesives. We lived then in the lead house, so dubbed because of the toxic dust we breathed when the landlord sanded down the shiplap. So many years of bad moves. But an improvement over the drive-by shooting house in West Volta and the roach coach in what cheer, Iowa. We had little money in the bank. We had some love. But what did we know? What could we have said anyway? What? Slivers. Home from rehab for just three hours. And we gather together to celebrate an almost Odyssean return. Grandma asks how you like your homecoming dinner. You say you don't at all. Slurring enough to let me know something else is amiss. We later found the stolen vanilla extract bottles, about 3,000, enough to make about 3,000 cakes. But you deny everything, climbing on the dining room table, stepping right through the lasagna, flattening the salad, belt in hand, slashing at us, brandishing against the chandelier's teardrops. I dimly hear the Waterford shatter in tinkling intervals a glass shower. 
You, a little King Kong, as we keep begging with you to please get down, you eventually do with the chandelier, from which you would just try to hang yourself. Six months later, you're in a place where they don't allow even zippers, no handles on the sinks, everything you now own donated. The dining room has been restored, but there's still so much missing crystal splinters under our nails. Not remembering you shrug it off the way a dog shakes off a dip. <laughs> what else the grapefruit said? At the Primrose Gardens group home, the guys share smokes around the picnic table. The house itself exhales a heavy lysoiled and linty air. Confined to an asphalt patch, under the 24-7 eye of neighborhood watch, they slouch under overrated stars. They have time. No AA tonight. Under the driveway spotlight, they lean, listening for the fence dog's advice. Brandon swears, horror movies put me here, that and the drugs. Back, empty-handed, from a shop right run, little James explains. The grapefruits were talking. Grocery voices again. They say, don't buy me. Never mind the ice pick in somebody's eye that sent him up. Inside, the house hums clean as the dryers tumble on cycle fluff. They're like seven snow whites, worn out after another day of scrubbing, mopping, vacuuming, as if conscience could be cleared by a good once over and a well-made bed. Conned on all counts, I'm here to see my son, the witch's apple of my eye. But they all greet, hi, mama, mama. Big Eric wails, when are you gonna bake that lemon meringue? I lie easily, promising next time, next time. Return of the Woolly Mammoth. You rarely wore it, though you yourself chose the color, midnight blue, and knee-length cut. In derision, you named it the Woolly Mammoth, pointing to its Pleistocene proportions. Still, at each sign of snow, I nagged you to wear it. The last time I saw you, you confessed you'd have to give it away. Not one more winter, you swore. Yet when you chose it once more, were you thinking of me? Last of its species, the mammoth was hunted to extinction. In a different ice age, it took you down under the cold waters of the dam, and sure enough, kept you down. Sodden for a month, until you surfaced found. I like to think of you buttoned up and until the last breaths beats. Its boxy bulk somehow kept you unaware, insulated from creeping cold discovery. <laughs> Spring break. Charlie, the boy next door, buried today, went unexpectedly but peacefully in the early hours, so the obit goes, which suggests just one thing, as he was 17, and the ambulance came so quietly. Passing through the rainy service, I saw a great well-wishing crowd had gathered in the churchyard, shriekers and weepers aplenty, surrounding the bereaved mother, a parking lot pieta. She looked up to proclaim, Charlie's filled his purpose here. Others insisting he was eagerly looking forward to Williams that fall. That party tent will have to come down. From behind my curtains, a parade of cars and casseroles keeps coming up their driveway. Am I bitter that our oddball family had no such thing? when our son had done the same? Not long after our disaster, smoke poured from their house. 
gas oven about to blow. We danced on our porch, Romans eager for some amphitheater sport. When nothing happened, we felt downcast, bedeviled. Why were even the not-so-nice families spared while we hung black creep on our Christmas wreath? In the green insult of the spring, none bloomed from the store-bought daffodil bouquet. Dried yellowed wisps like pinched wasp wings, I kept them hovering in cloudy water. And after all was done, even smiled in their direction. <laughs> Open door in the trestle work. Sal only wants to lie on the tracks, as his 16-year-old daughter did. Always he speaks of her ending gently. She lay down like the child's prayer to sleep. Not she walked or she jumped. Ray still reels from his car's swerve to the guardrail, luckily able to stop his daughter from jumping into moving traffic, only to find her home in the basement a week later, successful at last, bag molting her brown curls. Kenny keeps his wife's kitchen stepladder in his car's front seat, which she had lugged in case she couldn't clear the bridge edge but she found an open door in the trestle work. Melissa only came once. Her husband hit her enough. She blamed herself, then he set the bedroom on fire. Janice's son hung a tarnished, twisting chandelier for months in the foyer of an abandoned house. She insisted on seeing him, even though his eyes had hollowed out, because she hadn't seen him for over a year. So she stuck sunglasses on him and kept it open casket cool. The last one. <laughs> Impromptu. Listening to your brother Warren play another Chopin etude, Aeolian harp. And dear God, there you are. In jeans, bold plaid shirt, at ease, beside him on the bench mild-mannered, encouraging him. Once so jealous he got the lessons you'd show us all. You two teaching yourself for a lease. I stammer, but you're, you're unable to get that lead word said. You reply, it's all right, mom. I can stay, dinner, and even the weekend, leaving me so stupidly pleased. I can wake and stay pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Sean Webb will be introduced by Ken Roberts. I think it's incredible the diversity of poems you're hearing today. <laughs> Wait, I can't take credit for it. The board can't take credit for it. It must be some kind of synchronicity in the universe. But. Um, Sean Webb comes to us today from Pennsylvania. He received an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, and he apparently has survived along with Sharon. He was selected by Grace Paley to serve as Poet Laureate of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, in 2005. His work has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies. He won the Tucson Festival of Books Literary Prize for Poetry, the Asheville Poetry Review William Matthews Poetry Prize, and the Gemini Magazine Poetry Open. His chapbook, The Constant Parades, was selected by Afra Weaver and is published by Moonstone Arts. And his chapbook, What Cannot Stay Small Forever, is published by Finishing Line Press. Sean also has an extensive experience as a medical and scientific writer and editor. And if you are having trouble coming up with the right word for your next poem, ask him because he currently works as a lexicographer. <laughs> Sean Webb. Congratulations to, 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 and to everyone. Um, and thank you to the, to the foundation. Uh, and it's great to learn a, a bit about Laura Boss and 
I find that a couple people I know in Philadelphia uh, knew Laura. And, uh, and it's nice to meet Patterson. My, own, my only uh, little thread I can think of is I have a good friend back in Salt Lake City whose father was a pharmacist in Patterson. He used to fill prescriptions for William Carlos Williams. So it's a wonderful little thread. Um, this first poem I wrote uh, after I was visiting one of my favorite places, uh, Cape Disappointment in Washington. But I wrote it for a woman I knew in high school who absolutely loves poetry, but she loves it mostly from a formal, metric, prosodic understanding of things, which is wonderful, but I just want, kind of wanted to respond to that. It's called Disappointment Awaits. It's the uh, title poem from my collection that I submitted. I am thinking of the scattered remains, broken timbers, and lost sailors lying beneath the turbulent surface of the Pacific, overlooked by lighthouses. We have tried to warn you, but it doesn't always work. We do our best. There are places where the sea winds have eaten through fence posts. There are breakwaters built against the ocean that need reinforced time and again. I live in a mind that has mitigated much of the danger nature poses. Cape Disappointment is a lovely place to visit. I sense more threat from the other visitors out in mass casting their thin lines into the unknown, clinging to a kind of certainty, a longing for knowing. Know that poets lift the voice of God. Give up your view of an underlying homogeneity of craft for the business of living. It is messy out here. Our feet get tangled and we stumble into something new. Maybe years later, I remember your bright and earnest face Remember what promise you showed. You became so good at assembling the bones beneath the tiny beacons of warning lights where I keep foundering on the rocks. Thank you. And um, this is a poem called Immolation. Um, I used to be a drunken poet many years ago. And uh, I wrote this very recently. And I'm not a drunk, but it, it reflects a little bit of what it's like being a drunk. It's called Immolation. In the fourth century, the monk Feiyu, in protest of an illegitimate principality, swallowed incense chips and wrapped his body in oiled cloth. He set himself aflame and chanted while his body was consumed. Witnesses to that event were filled with grief and admiration. Hundreds of years later, during the Raskal, when the zealots of piety stood for purification of the Russian Orthodox faith, faith, entire villages of old believers baptized themselves in fire. When I drink to quell the boredom, agitation, and fears of eternal torment, I hold steadfast to the unswerving certainty that everything is unbearable. Therefore, I stand alone, avoiding such fervor to let you know I mean business, as I am slowly consumed by joyless spirits of a vanishing and lonely God. And I'll read a couple more, but this one is a bit long, and it, it's, um, it's a, uh, I wrote this, it took about 15 years to write this. Uh, when I was in grad school, I was tasked with assessing some things in special collections to see if they were worth publishing. And one of the things I was assigned to look at were the diaries of a farmer named Elmer Box. And he wrote an entry every single day for 46 years and never conveyed a single emotion, um, anything about anything, even the days his kids were born, just their name and born, except at one point, he wrote that he went to the county fair and she was there. It's the only mystery in 46 years of, of uh, banteries. 
And I wanted to write about it for years, and then something came out about an abstract uh, uh, painting exhibit, and all the pieces fell together from that. We were, we were asked to write something in response to that. It's called Fields. From 36,000 feet, the farms look like so much nothing. Then one field meets another and boundaries result, a communal mandri and laid over the curvature of earth. But there is more in there in the stretches of earth and colors. I can only speculate on the crops and what they will feed. In the hours we pass over Iowa, nothing appears to happen. No movement is detected. The fields seem as if they have always been there, unchanged. I can't imagine life outside of the order that has been created in the lines. I turn back to the magazine in my lap and read an article about Pike's Market, which includes the requisite photo of someone throwing a fish into the arms of another. Back in Iowa, in the last century, it was my job once to sit in the university's special collections and assess donated manuscripts for gold nuggets worthy of print. In the century before that, a man named Elmer Box began his diary. I don't know why he decided to start it. He said nothing special about that day, but it commenced. 47 years, an entry every day, 47 bound editions. Not a hint of sentiment. Each day, a record of the weather, crops planted and harvested, fences fixed, all halters mended, no mention of his wife, no sensual description of land, home, bed. The three days his children were born, their entries were as commonplace as the corn in the field. I tried to imagine Elmer tinkering in the barn in work boots and thinning hair, his brown hands working from the ends of his flannel shirt as the sun worked further into the mountain. A gas lamp illumining and shadowing stirring animals, water plumped eaves drying and ticking in the morning, last night's mended halter being secured to a beast's body, dull steel turning out the soil raised in long rows, Elmer winding his watch in blue dawn, blackbirds everywhere on barn and fences on the plain gray wooden house. Elmer figured against the clearing, turning the crop seeds back in, tilling dirt into uniform mounds as dark as the morning's coffee grounds. 47 years. I sat there for days, combing for one hint of an express life, one thread stitching his heart to another. I surveyed the lonely landscape like Zhivago until finally a mention of going to the fair. Nothing special, no betrayal of a moment's joy, the proceedings mundane as sausage links, and then she was there. A brief glimpse of an interior life, an enemy, a love that got away. After years of taciturn cataloging, cataloging of life's humdrum features, maybe it was time to open up. I read ahead, searching for clues. Would she turn up again, a 4th of July celebration, a sudden effusion of flowery words bursting in a flourish of fireworks? I would like to say that tiny fissure blew his world open, that one small key in the lock turned and his reticence undammed, but nothing followed. Volume after volume, I scrutinized the weather patterns of Iowa, logging of crop events, fall harvest set down by a leathery hand, his life so bound and rocky, nothing could gain purchase. Year after year it went until one day it ended and his son tied it up with the longest entry in the entire compilation, explaining with some measured emotion how Elmer dropped dead shoveling the car out in heavy snow. A fitting departure, a solitary act rife with futility. The snows of Iowa fill in the fields again and again. It couldn't possibly have been the man's intent to have a more profound effect on, my, on me than any art, any literature, any music I have encountered before or since. I spent the days trying to shake his ghost, but he was chained to me as I walked to my classes, sat at my typewriter, lied in bed with my wife. I was shocked by the brutal starkness, the complete abstraction in a very objective and concrete world. Nearly half a century committed to paper, only one loose thread, one mystery so shallow it dried in an instant. 
a lifelong exercise in stoic repressed communication. Encountering it desiccated my heart and made me believe in God just enough to believe in God's abandonment. Still on the plane, I return my attention to the ground. Fewer farms now and the beginnings of mountains. The microscopic organisms growing uncontrollably. Thick clouds become thinner the closer they get until the whiteness separates completely and what was there slips into the ether and there's nothing left to explain. Surely there is more than I see. Interiors of fields and squares of houses. Generations cycling through the seasons under the expansive field of blue sky. Occasionally a plane flying over, filled with distant lives, abstract and common as grains of fall wheat that culminate in an immense register of abundance. Thank you. I forget how hard that is to read. I haven't read that in a long time. Um, and sorry that I introduced it and then explained the whole thing in the poem. But I forgot that everything was in there. And I'll finish with uh, this, uh, just a short poem. It's called The Tao of Taos. I remember a hateful time in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, a spirit no soft bed piled with colorful wool blankets could quell. The healing of Chimayo was an empty field I would not cross. I was living in the land of estrangement, bitter holdings clinging to my insides like dagger moths. How could I know, years later, I would be waiting for a breakfast to be served among young strangers in a small mountain town, listening to Billie Holiday sing from the past of the wonders of autumn in New York, alone, with my thoughts, with thoughts of my life's work, to move beyond forgiveness, to arrive at a place I do not suffer daily crucifixions. I just want to thank everybody for coming, especially thank. Miriam, all the finalists, it was really a great reading. Um, I know we all really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. And um, I would just ask that if you have the ability to support the foundation going forward so we can continue to do this and continue to publish lips. Um, I know it's important to me personally and important to many people in the room. And um, we appreciate all the support that you've given us by coming here today. And... Um, by um, just your presence, contributing the poems and everything else. So thank you. And um, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you to all the finalists. And thank you to, uh, to the board. We've still got books left. Um, and I'm sure people would be happy to sign them. So thanks very much for coming. And see you next year. Thank you. One other thing before you go. We have uh, workshops. Uh, we have a meeting on the first Saturday in April, and we have workshops, and we have a few spaces left in the workshops. So if you want to go on the web and sign up for a workshop, they're usually quite wonderful, and uh, we, hope, we hope you enjoy it.